In a galaxy as hostile as this, those who consider themselves prospective conquerors must consider the range of threats and environments that their soldiers shall face as they set out upon their great work. Vicious Xenos, recalcitrant human realms, poisonous atmospheres, crushing pressures. These and a myriad other more besides were the obstacles to mankind's manifest destiny among the stars at the outset of the Emperor's most wondrous great crusade. To protect his treasured Astartes, the precious product of his incalculable genius, the Emperor charged his subjects with the creation of arraignment befitting the finest soldiers the galaxy had ever known. Know then that this is a record concerning the development, history, and nature of the powered armor of the Legionnaires Astartes. The origin of true powered armor has long since been lost to the histories of humanity. It was likely that it originated at some point in the dark age of technology, the millennia spanning era of unprecedented human scientific advancement, and no doubt a product of the standard template construct, complex analytical artificial intelligences that could create new technologies simply upon the needs humanity would present them. Recovery of lost knowledge, and indeed fragments of STC systems, has often been the driving force behind the development of power armor, so this would appear to be the most solid theory regarding its origin. During the Age of Strife, the secrets of power armor's creation were lost in the fires of humanity's downfall, surviving only in isolated spheres or enclaves. On the irradiated wastelands of old Earth, techno-barbarians, clad in crude, cobbled-together powered suits, clashed over the scant resources and dust-buried archaeotech of the homeworld. It was not until the coming of the Emperor and the beginning of the Unification Wars that Power Armor saw its first steps towards proper standardization with the Mark I suit. Technically, this suit could be said to be the product of the various barbarian polities of Terra, but it was the Emperor who standardized the design as much as it was possible in the chaos of the Unity Era. Worn by his Thunder Warriors, the first genetically enhanced Imperial soldiers, the armor was as crude and effective as they were. It granted incredible protection to the torso and arms, as well as increasing the already prodigious strength of its wearer three or four times over. As the brutal nature of Terran warfare in this period was often fought in extremely close quarters, this mark prioritized the protection of the warrior's front, with the rear of the armor, often a mass of thrumming and exposed power cables, connecting to a power pack slung upon the wearer's back. The Thunder Warriors would benefit from the advancement of this mark, and more often than not were clad in armored greaves and boots too. The earliest Astartes of the Proto-Legions also bore this armor mark, but the name itself, Thunder Armor, testifies to the iconic warriors who wore it first and to the Emperor's personal heraldry of the Unity Era, the raptor and lightning bolt that adorned every breastplate. With the unification of Terra and the political union with the Mechanicum of Mars, the factories of the Red Planet and the adepts of its ruling body were set to the creation of a newer, more advanced armor mark, resulting in the creation of the Mark II, the advent of which is one of the most pivotal technological developments in the history of the Imperium. The Mark I suit, while suitable for the barbarity of the Unification Wars, was not fully enclosed, providing no life support in the hard vacuum of space and only scant protection against advanced rad or chemical weaponry. With the Emperor's great endeavor about to dust off from the wastes of Terra and take to the stars, Mark I plate was entirely insufficient for the task at hand. The Mark II surpassed it in every way possible. The armor was fully enclosed and provided a robust life support system for the Astartes wearing it. Additionally, advances in the Emperor's gene craft had led to the development and implantation in every Astartes of the Black Carapace, a subdermal layer of plating and neural transmitters that allowed the wearer to interface with his armor directly, in effect treating it like a layer of his own skin. 
The advantages this confers are boundless. The auto senses of the new Mark II helms allow for thought-activated communication links with other Astartes, as well as a similarly controlled audio and visual filtering, tactical displays, and the links to sensory data through Auspex webs developed on Red Mars. Protection was also afforded to the Marine by an advanced respiratory system that would filter many a toxic hazard before the Astartes' own formidable genetic enhancements even had to deal with them. The suit provided constant life sign monitoring and could dispense a range of chemical stimulants or medical drugs should injury be sustained. The suit itself offered much more armor protection than its predecessor. Cable exposure was kept to a minimum, with all of the chest cabling covered by plate thanks to the development of a more efficient cooling mechanism, a design which unfortunately could not be copied for the leg armor leading to some exposure of cabling there. Efficiency was marked in the new power pack, which, despite being roughly the same size as the Mark I, could provide far more power to more systems, and was noticeably quieter when active. The Mark II is widely considered to be one of the most efficient marks ever developed by the Imperium, and proved decisive in the early victories of the Great Crusade, as it expanded through the Sol system and beyond. On countless worlds, the image of an Astartes striding through torrents of small arms fire, or across the atmosphere-lacking void, was seared into the collective consciousness of the new Imperium and its subjugated realms. For this reason, it is commonly dubbed the Crusade Armor. Every single Astartes Legion was outfitted with these suits, and many would still be making widespread use of them 200 years later, during the beginning of the Great Heresy. The worlds of the Galactic Core, once reached by the vanguard expeditionary fleets of the Great Crusade, presented the Imperium with an unforeseen issue. The densely populated and extremely stubborn polities encountered there presented the legions with a greater than anticipated amount of boarding actions upon enemy ships and orbitals, as well as city fighting in thick urbanized zones. While the Mark II armor still fared well, casualties were higher than desirable, and progress slow. The Imperium's answer was the iterative advancement of the Mark II in the form of the Mark III, or Iron Armor. This mark placed heavy emphasis on protection, and afforded its wearer much more ablative plating, especially geared towards frontal defenses. Reinforced joint plating was also provided enhancing the armor's primary role as protection during boarding actions, tunnel engagements, and void warfare. Mark III plate provided the Astartes with the most complete protection outside of the tactical dreadnought armor, and proved widely popular, with first the legions engaged on fronts in the galactic core, and later those who specialized in close quarter combat, or siege and boarding engagements. Never designed as a full replacement for the Mark II, Iron Armor was noticeably more power-hungry than its predecessor, and less easily maintainable. Additionally, the bulk made it somewhat slower. All of these factors meant that at no point was any one legion entirely outfitted with this mark, although some employed a greater number of the suits, depending upon their specific warfare predilection. The true successor to Crusade Armor came with the advent of the Mark IV, in the closing decades of the Great Crusade. The Mark II and III, while still uniformly accepted, were becoming prone to faults, and with supply lines from Forge Worlds growing longer and longer as the Crusade fronts expanded ever outwards, the Mechanicum developed a new mark for centralized issue. Dubbed the Maximus Suit, the Mark IV made full use of all power armor knowledge the Mechanicum had recovered during the 200 years since the development of the Mark II, dispensing with the abutting plates of the earlier design, in favor of static but adaptable armor casings, the Mark IV reduced the movement of an Astartes by a marginal degree, but offered far more protection. In addition to almost eliminating the possibility of faults and making the suits far easier to maintain over long periods of time. This was, additionally, the first mark to allow the wearer full range of motion of his head. Previous marks had allowed for the rotation of the helm 
but no movement upon the y-axis, which advancements in neuroconnectors allowed the Mechanicum to eliminate in the Mark IV. The culmination of the Crusade's armor development, Maximus Plate represented an improvement in almost every capacity. By the outbreak of the Great Heresy, many of the legions were entirely re-equipped with it, and indeed, those that saw first preference in its deployment would prove somewhat telling in dreadful hindsight. The outbreak of Horus's treachery saw a period of unprecedented upheaval and destruction for the galaxy. While the full details of this are obviously too great in import to develop upon here, its effect on armor production was marked. Forge worlds, both loyalist and traitor, continued development of the Maximus Plate, but also newer designs that lacked centralized authority or direction. In the field, too, Astartes from every legion would often find themselves cut off from any and all supply, but forced to continue fighting for their cause. Over the course of the heresy, this led to the development of a myriad of ad hoc armors, leading in effect to the accidental creation of a whole new mark, the Mark V, or heresy pattern. While not a true iteration of official production armor by any means, there were enough commonalities shared across the galaxy that it is deemed such for the purposes of history. With resupply to loyalist, and indeed most traitor legions rendered difficult to impossible by the rapidly shifting fronts that embodied the warfare of the heresy, attendant mechanical elements, or even legion tech marines, were forced to manufacture armor for their Astartes out of the most basic of materials. Mark V armor is, generally speaking, structured on top of an older suit, explaining why the various pieces of these suits often appear identical to Maximus or Crusade armor. Plasteel and ceramite were crudely attached to these older suits, making heavy use of the simple but effective molecular bonding stud technique, giving the mark its distinctive orbs. These studs provided not only an easy-to-deploy in-field upgrade, but also additional ablative properties for added protection. Despite being by its nature easy to both produce and maintain, as new suits could be grafted together from battlefield spoils pulled from the bodies of the fallen, these armors were not without significant issues. The power cabling, often scavenged from ancient suits, provided a myriad of cooling problems, and often had to be welded to the surface of the armor simply to ensure that it could run. Even with these precautions, the suits were dreadfully prone to overheating, forcing many an Astartes to cycle down his power pack and deal with suboptimal armor performance to prevent a total overload. Despite the improvised nature of the mark and its many faults, it was nonetheless responsible for allowing many of the Loyalist legions to continue their fight against the hated traitors during the heresy, and will ever stand as a testament to the ingenuity of these legions, and their Mechanicum attendants in circumstances of the most extreme privation. The last true iteration of power armor before the Battle of Terra was the Mark VI Corvus armor. Originally to be designated the true Mark V, this armor underwent extensive development processes due to its rather specialized nature, as the distaste its properties engendered from certain legions prevented large-scale research. With the Mark IV in full production, and proving to be a resounding success amongst every legion, for its seemingly masterful balance of protection and speed, the Mechanicum Adepts shifted focus from an iterative improvement on these qualities to other factors, such as ease of repair. The Mark VI would come to feature easily replaceable circuitry and components, as well as redundant power cabling for added failsafes. The molecular bonding studs common upon Mark V suits were employed for the left shoulder pauldron, as the Mechanicum Data Smiths had determined this side would be the one most commonly taking enemy fire. Additionally, the armor plating was designed to be lighter than its predecessor, but in doing so provided an incredibly smooth fit, as well as allowing a range of movement unparalleled by any previous suit. Several years before the heresy's outbreak, a combat test featuring the first 1,000 prototype suits was undertaken against the Eldar 
in the Scaland Campaign by elements of the 4th Legion Iron Warriors and 18th Legion Salamanders. Despite the Mechanicum's overall satisfaction with its performance, both legions expressed severe reservations about the new mark, requesting it be reworked to provide heavier protection and fill the role of heavy assault armor. The Mechanicum, unwilling to entirely abandon the Mark VI, was maneuvered into selecting the 19th Legion Raven Guard to provide the Mark its final mass combat test. It was rumored that the Primarch of the Fourth, Perturabo, was responsible for ensuring that the Understrength Legion was chosen, as a severe loss of life of its Astartes during the trial would see the death knell of the Mark he viewed with such extreme dissatisfaction. The Iron Lord's scheme was to backfire stunningly, as the Raven Guard took to the armor like a second skin. Owing to improvements in the auto senses, in the now iconic conical or beak shaped helmet, as well as the speed of movement the Mark granted, the armor proved a perfect fit for the highly mobile warfare the 19th Legion excelled at. Such was the degree of success in the remainder of the campaign that the delighted Mechanicum went on to adopt the majority of improvements suggested by the Astartes of the Raven Guard, and the armor was dubbed the Corvus Mark in honor of the Legion's Primarch, Corvus Corax. Fast tracked for production, the armor only commenced manufacturing scant solar months before the Istvan atrocity, and few legions could ever employ this suit in large amounts in the years to follow. The majority of those produced were earmarked for the Raven Guard, as their actions in the Scaland campaign had shown them to be the most competent utilizers of its capabilities. That being said, through clandestine actions, the 20th Legion, Alpha Legion, were able to obtain an unknown number of Mark VI suits for their own purposes, and no doubt supplied some of these to their traitorous kin. In many ways, the development of the armor of the Legionnaires Astartes mirrors the course of the Imperium throughout this time period, from the humble beginnings of the Mark I, through the steadfast crusading Mark II and III, mankind drove back the darkness, bearing forth the advanced fruit of the Mark IV, a testament to the progress of the era and the glorious reunification of humanity with its lost kin and lost knowledge, only for this soon to fall into the dreadful desperation marked by the Mark V.